and, uh, and make changes like that. Um, so the conclusion is that every column in a table could be considered a key, one primary and the rest foreign. And so the picture of this that we would see here is imagine that every, uh, every column is, a row, is an arrow in this graph. So manager points from employee to employee, to DPT points from employee to department, secretary points from department to employee, and first and last point to string and name points to string. And you could also say that if I do MGR followed by DPT, that's the same thing as just doing DPT straight. And that secretary followed by department just is ID on department. And then by doing that, I've given you a, um, well, it turned out that, of course, this is a category. And this category encodes the foreign key, primary key relationships of, um, oh, and the primary key, by the way, way is the, the identity arrows on each thing. So th this, this category down here encodes the structure of this database schema. So the question, I guess, so let's see. Right, so a database schema is a system of tables linked by foreign keys. And that can be considered just the category. So each object, you can see three objects here, and what, what seven arrows, ten arrows. Um, each object is an employee, and all the arrows out of it, like one, two, three, four, are the columns of that table. Every object in the table, every arrow is a column. The source of the arrow is the table that that column is in, and the target of the arrow is where it takes its values. Um, so declaring business rules, as I said, is just declaring the composition law. And then the question is, what about that data? What about what's filling up those tables? The answer is that um, suppose we have this category C, then a functor from C to sets consists of, well, for every object I'm going to need a set. So I'm going to need a set for this, this, and this. For every arrow, I'm going to need a function. And for every composition law, I'm going to require that those equations hold. And so here's a picture of it. Um, the employee, uh, I abbreviated to an E, is being sent to this set. The D is being sent to this set. Or, and the strings are being sent to this set, and the arrows are actual functions. So what, what is a function f taking 101, 102, 103 to here? Well, it needs to give me three strings, one for 101, one for 102, and one for 103. And first is exactly doing that. And similarly, this d arrow department here is taking me from this set to this set. So you can just think of a two-column table as a function, uh, and this is just one, two, three, four, two column tables, kind of, each one, one for each arrow. Okay, so I think I've kind of said this five times, but um, category is a schema, like a small, finite category you can think of as a database schema, and vice versa. And the objects of, this, of, the, of it are the tables, and the arrows are the columns. And a functor fills the tables with compatible data in the sense that all the composition laws are going to work. And, um, and so that's the basic idea. So I really want that to be clear because that's kind of a, the heart of the talk. And then the rest is just like, OK, what do you do with it now that you have that? So what is this? OK, so, so hopefully these ideas are pretty clear. That's at least what I was going for. And what's, the, what's so good about that? Well, first of all, conceptual clarity is nice. It's nice not to have. So a schema, what people think of is a set of relations, 103 tables, each one a relation, and they're matched up in this crazy way, and, and there's triggers going around and all sorts of stuff. And it's nice to just say, oh, no, it's, it's just a small category. Um, and so, OK, that's one nice thing. And usually something that's simple is flexible. So I'm going to try to show you how it's flexible in a second. And the outline of the rest of this talk is that there's something called the growth and deconstruction, which um, people, um, uh, uh, I, I don't know if people know about, but it's, it's a nice categorical construction. And it allows us to kind of switch our viewpoint from the relational type table view to a more semi-structured view, where you're allowed to have nulls and things like that, um, or even false things. Um, and I'll get into that in a second. Second of all, how 
if you have two schemas and they're just categories, then what does a functor between them do? Well, that allows you, you know, this one's a kind of a viewpoint on the world or what you care about. This one's a viewpoint on the world, and you found some, some link that sends, that kind of connects them. Well, through that link, you can import data from, from one schema to the other and vice versa. So I'll talk about that. And then I'll talk about integration of databases and programming languages through category theory. And finally, uh, application of monads to database theory. So, Ed, how much time would you say? Um, if you got probably another half an hour. Okay. Well, then that's plenty. Yeah. We'll run over a little bit, but not, not too much. Okay. So the growth and deconstruction, I'll describe it for you. There's a category valued one and a set valued one. And um, if you're into kinds and types, then I think there's actually, they use the category valued one to, there's a functor on the category of kinds, that is the category of types, and then you grow them, deconstruct it, and then you get the category of types or something like that. Uh, it's not too hard, but, um, but here's the idea for the set value one. So suppose you have a category C and a functor to set, then the growth and deconstruction takes anything of that form and gives you a new category out. And what does it do? Well, if you have this category and this, func this is a picture of a functor to sets, namely three sets and two arrows between them, how do you convert this into a new category? Well, you kind of do it in the obvious way. Every element you see there, you make an object, and every arrow, uh, you turn it into lots of arrows. So I guess since A1 was going to B1, I, I put in a map A1 to B1, uh, an arrow, A2 to B1, and A3 to B2, et cetera. So it's also known as the category of elements of delta. It throws all of the elements into one big category and sends them wherever they ought to obviously, quote unquote, should go. Okay, so what does it mean on a database state? Because that's what a database state, I was saying, is. I have a category, which is a schema, and I have a state, which is the functor to sets. And if you remember, this was the picture of our category, and this was the state on it. Well, the growth and deconstruction of it, I'm going to throw um, 101, 102, and 103, Q10, and XO2, and all of the strings in the world into one gigantic category. And I'm going to throw an arrow in for the department of 101 is Q10, the first name of 101 is David, the last name of 101 is Hilbert, the manager is 103, it's the name of XO2 is production. And I will do that for all of them. So it's a much, much bigger thing, but I didn't want to have arrows everywhere in there. So you just made it untyped? I Almost. somehow made it untyped. Yep. Uh, aren't, aren't those disjoint? Because like if David, if David, if you had two, um, you know, You're two right. strings, you have a... Huh. We can recover a type. Is that yeah, you can recover the type information by the object yeah. itself. Uh, it's it's a pair of the, of the More joking, yeah. but yes. it is amazing right. to me. In some sense, you've untyped it. Right. You throw it well, all you can, you can still yeah. puppet in master fact, the things into the fact, place you like. Not only do you get a c category, but you're always going to get a functor back down to your original category. Mm -hmm. So 101, 102, 103 will go to E. Q10 and XO2 will go to D. All these will go to string. And every arrow in here is going to go to, yeah. well, D is going to go to D. Etc. If, if, if you put it in the, the terms of the sigma types that we had just in the last talk, you can you can view it as as, as retaining the sigma type so that pi is just yeah, pulling off the first half. That. I was hoping that 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 that, that would work. Yes. Um, but now let me say, look at the inverse image of this dot. Look at all the things that went to this dot. Well, it was 101, 102, 103. Look at all the things that went to D under this functor. It was Q10, XO2. So. The quote fiber. This is a. You can think of this huge category mapping down to a small one, and over each dot in the small one, the small one is the schema, and over each dot sits a, a fiber. It's called uh, things mapping to it, and that fiber is exactly the rows in that table. Each one of these represents a table, and its rows are here. And the, so the so the fibers, the fiber over E, is a set of employees. Uh, right. Oh, well, I said it's clear, but maybe it's not completely clear. The, the relation to RDF triples is, quote, clear. Every arrow f taking x to y here is a triple. I don't know if you guys know RDF or have ever heard of it, but uh, it's a subject, predicate, uh, object relationship. And so you can say the department of 101 is Q10, the name of 101 is David, the last name of 101 is Hilbert, and all those are kind of written as single arrows upstairs. And the schema, the RDF schema, is here. 
And so this is kind of a triple store and an RDF schema. But what's nice is that you know what a category theorist loves to do is take a, a set value functor and look at its growth and deconstruction because it's a very simple and a nice thing to do. It's nice that that automatically produces something like a triple store um, or RDF. It's cute. Kind of a yeah. It's kind of cute, right? So it just it's just a good sign. It's like, is it useful? I don't know. Uh, but it's a good sign because it, it shows that everyone wants to say your RDF and, and relational are related. And of course, there's lots of ways of showing they're related. I mean, you're just yeah. twisting it 90 degrees. You're just twisting it 90 degrees, exactly. <laughs> so given C, requiring a functor from C to set may be too restrictive. This is a well-known issue with relational databases. You have the schema of everything you should know, but the guy on the other end of the phone just forgot to tell you their telephone number. So what are you going to do? Not enter your row? Yes. <laughs> but if you do that, then you've lost a lot of data. I'm OK with that. <laughs> but, but Verizon isn't. Verizon can afford it. Well, no. But the fact is, the fact is that it just can't stand. It, like, it's just a fact that relational has a lot of really great advantages. But sometimes it's too restrictive. Sometimes you don't know everything you should know, or you have too much data, or something's wrong. Um, if you're a category theory lover, a growth and deconstruction like this is called a discrete op vibration. What that means is, and so I'm going to get to something in a second, I'm kind of skipping around for a second for some reason, but what it means is that given any guy up here, say 101, you look at what he is, it's, it's an employee, and you take any arrow out of it, then there's going to be a unique arrow out of 101 corresponding to that arrow down here. That doesn't have to be true for an arbitrary functor between two categories, but for a growth and deconstruction situation, it's true. So what if we relax that requirement and say, oh, I have 102 here, and I have D here, but I don't have an arrow D up here. Mm -hmm. Then you've all, all of a sudden allowed for this kind of semi-structured data. So any old functor in the world from any category to any other category can be thought of as data on C, but semi-structured data. So now, again, the fiber over A is 101, 102, 103, 104. Fiber over B is hello, goodbye. So that's kind of the, the rows of A are these. And this is what's supposed to, this is F of these things. But um, F of 101 is hello. F of 102 is hello. 103 doesn't have an arrow over it. And 104 has two of them. So someone accidentally ant entered two answers for, for so-and-so's phone number, or last name, I guess. Um, you can still keep that around. In the relational model, you simply can't do it. But here, or, or you have a null, you can't do it in a strict relational theory. But here, it's, it's fine to do that if you just consider it a functor. Um, also, any bad data, quote unquote, like I have a composition law, a business rule, that could be unsatisfied upstairs. Um, that's all fine. By the, so all let's call something like this a semi-state, a semi-structured state. It can be functorial correct, functorially corrected to a state if necessary. So given something like this, I can do what you want and just destroy uh, anything you don't have all the info for. What? You can just destroy anything you don't have all the info for. Right. Right. I mean, yeah, you can you, you you can have an unstructured mass of goo and then drop the goo later. But then right. why were you so why were you dealing with keeping the mass of goo in the first place? Well, but some, let's say you want to run SQL yeah. on it or something, then you drop the goo <laughs> and run. No, you fast. keep the goo if you want to run SQL. Wait, what's the goo again? The goo is the goo like category. Okay. Right? You said, oh, well, now I can I thought, I thought, I thought the goo in that, in that statement was the, all of the miscellaneous semi-state data. Right.